Hi everybody, my name is Sharunik. I am one of the co-founders and organizers of the um, Humanities Podcast Symposium and the Humanities Podcast Network. Um, I think uh, folks who are here right now have been in the symposium for a while, so there's nothing really new to say in terms of introduction. And since this is like an open round table, um, I'm not gonna read out bios, but I would still um, you know, encourage you know, people who speak to kind of introduce themselves so that we know who we are. Um, it's very simple. We, are, we have three kind of organizing questions, uh, which uh, I'm gonna chair the session and I'm gonna ask the question and then our speakers are going to kind of have um, back and forth session answering those questions. And at the end, we will open um, the session up for um, the audience. We, I mean, we are a small, cozy group, so I'm really hoping for um, a very rich, intense conversation. Um, for so, the you know the the usual requests when someone else is speaking, please keep your uh, mic muted, just so that there's no uh, sound interference. Um, and of course, you're welcome to if you if turning your camera on is a problem, that's totally fine. There's no pressure. Uh, and when I, um, there's no, again, like since this is a round table, I'm not gonna ask you to kind of, you know, okay, so let's ask questions. So you can just, you know, speak up on, or raise your hand if you're comfortable, then I can call on you. All right. Um, so uh, I will ask my first question which is um, why do we, as people of color, use podcasts as our medium uh, or why should we use it, use it as our medium and what are its constitutive challenges and opportunities? And I would welcome our speakers to take it over. Whoever wants to go first. Okay, I can, I can do it if that's... Um, yeah, please. All right. So uh, to briefly introduce myself, I am Dr. Varsha Punjwani and I'm a Shakespeare lecturer. I'm the creator and host of Women and Shakespeare podcast. And I love my podcast logo so much. Somebody else designed it that I, uh, that I put it on everything. I'm wearing it right now. Uh, but I'll shamelessly uh, put it on in the chat as well. And my um, podcast began as a teaching resource. Uh, we didn't have the teaching resource that I thought we needed, so we created it. And now it has all fed into my research. So my book, which is Podcasts and Feminist Shakespeare Pedagogy, is being published by Cambridge University Press, and that will be out uh, later this month, at the end of this month. So you asked, um, why do we as people of color use podcasts as our medium and what are the challenges and opportunities? And I would ask everyone to cast your mind back and perhaps you remember the US vice presidential debate in which uh, there was a clip um, which stitched together moments of uh, you know, Senator Kam Kamala Harris who was um, sort of uh, debating with Mike Pence and repeatedly she had to say, Mr. Vice President, I'm speaking, I'm speaking, right? So um, this happened a lot of times in that debate. And I think that it resonated with so many women generally and with women of color specifically, because we have experience of people just not listening to us, right? I mean, she had to repeatedly say the obvious that I'm speaking here um, because he was just talking over her. Um, and unfortunately, this moment has a very robust history. So in her lecture, The Public Voice of Women, um, classics professor Mary Beard takes a very long view of what she terms is the culturally awkward relationship between the voice of women and the public sphere in the West. And she argues 
that authoritative public speech has been considered the exclusive purview of men for hundreds of years in the West. Um, early 20th century broadcasting trends also reveal this kind of vocal prejudice. So for instance, uh, if we look at the BBC, British Broadcasting Corporation, they hired their first woman announcer of uh, public broadcasts, Giles uh, Borat in 1933, and they terminated her contract just after three months uh, because listeners were objecting to a woman's voice in the announcer's role. Uh, the story was similar in the US where NBC appointed Elsie Janis as their first woman announcer again in 1935, so it's quite late. And then listeners complained that a woman's voice was inappropriate for serious announcements. And again, she was taken off air for that. Um, and then recent work from Jennifer Stover, W.E.B. Du Bois, and David Sterling Brown indicates that race also gets in the way of registering black voices or voices of people of color as authoritative voices because the dominant white listening practices then set the tone for what is considered authoritative or worth paying attention to. So it is no surprise that women of color are the most overlooked public speakers, right? Because you have gender on marginalization in voices on the one hand, and you have race marginalization of voices on the other. Um, and this was certainly the case in my discipline, Shakespeare studies. So women have done amazing work in every research area. But if I was looking at keynote speaker lists at conferences and public talks, the invited speakers were overwhelmingly men and they were overwhelmingly white. So even if women were invited, they were white women. Um, I do have the data to back this up in my book, so I'm not just kind of, you know, <laughs> speaking um, or, or off the back of my experiences. Um, so my podcast, Women in Shakespeare, was about amplifying the voices of women generally, but women of color specifically, to show that there are commentators on Shakespeare out there and exciting, knowledgeable commentators on Shakespeare whom we should be hearing from, from pub, in public and in scholarly discourse. Um, so a podcast has emphasis on the public voice, right? Uh, therefore, I think it's a great resistance technology to the silencing of women of color um, in scholarly and in public uh, soundscape of Shakespeare. So I think this is what the opportunity is to be able to resist the um, oral hegemonic status quo. Um, the challenge, however, is that the internet is and continues to be a very toxic place for women um, in many ways. There was um, a report in 2017, Amnesty International published that report, and nearly a quarter of the women who were surveyed across eight countries said that they had experienced online abuse or harassment at least once. And this was the case in the UK and the US as well. And then in COVID-19 pandemic, there was another report that was done by different organizations and they only surveyed women and non-binary individuals and 46% of the respondents said that they had experienced online abuse. Um, and this figure increases to 50% if we consider black and minoritized women and non-binary people. So there was a lot of internet abuse. So the challenge is that you have to be fighting white supremacy and patriarchy, um, not in the technosphere as well. It's not like, oh, it's there. So you can just like escape online. Um, so I do think that we should occupy space on the internet. But I think it is good to be aware that there are real challenges here for women of color who uh, choose to have an online presence through a podcast and a public voice. Thank you so much, Varsha. Uh, and we will, when you know, when in the next question, we I think we will reverse the order. But for now, can I ask Brendan and Elisa to take up uh, this question? Yes, um, so 
thank you all for coming to our panel today. And it's actually really an exciting opportunity for us to talk about the work that we do as Black women and as Black uh, feminist anthropologists. So uh, I'm Brendan, and my co-host Alyssa James is also here with us today. Uh, we co-host Doors Daughters podcast, um, and we put the information for our podcast in the chat. For you all, so Zora's Daughters is a Black feminist anthropological um, take, I'll call it, on what's happening popularly. And so we use um, theoretical frameworks and analytical frameworks from Black feminist anthropology to look at the world around us and hopefully inspire our listeners to, to do some kind of change in their own worlds. So one of the challenges that we've experienced as podcasters and particularly as black women um, have honestly has been um, not having the access to certain kind of podcasting spaces as other women of color um, or other women in general. Um, and so one of the, the things that we want to point to um, right after or following up your, your wonderful presentation, Varsha, was just to point to the fact even within you know women of color right there are differences of access to crowds to protection for sure when we're thinking about online harassment um and also to privacy and so one of the ways that we have really um found podcasting to be useful for us as black women is that we don't have to put our faces on the screen right people don't have to know what we look like um we feel a layer of protection in that sense as well, right? There's kind of like a, a buffer between us and the outside world. And also it is a place for us um, as graduate students, right? To, to put our stake into the academic world um, in ways that kind of move past the gatekeeping of journals, right? Move past the gatekeeping process of, of publishing um, because we, our podcast, we self-produce, right? We, we publish on Anchor. So we're able to move around a lot of the hurdles that, um, that Black women experience when they're doing academic work. And we also reserve that kind of intellectual freedom to the sense that we, to the, to the market that we have it. Um, obviously, we can't say everything we want to say <laughs> on our podcast, but um, we it serves as a place for us to really just have that intellectual freedom and to explore and learn together and to learn with our listeners. And so that is something that we really treasure. Uh, our podcast was born in 2020 in the midst of the kind of the different uprisings that were happening um, in the U.S. around police violence. And then also some of the other conversations that were happening in our own um, anthropology department where we were experiencing um, violence and erasure from other students. And so this podcast really became a place for us to, to stake our own kind of academic um, expertise, right? to show not our department necessarily, but to show like whoever would listen, right? That we actually can produce academic knowledge um, and we can change the world around us. And so, those are kind of the the pluses and the challenges that we've had as as black women in the podcasting world. And Alyssa, I don't know if you wanted to add to that. Yeah, I think that that was, you know, that just about covered some of the things that we wanted to talk about. Um, hi everyone, I'm Alyssa, she her pronouns. Um, one one thing that I would add is the opportunity for us to connect with scholars from different from different places, a lot of the time, you know, especially for us being at Columbia and being in the Northeast, you kind of, you end up kind of just engaging with scholars that are also in the Northeast. And having this podcast and recording it via Zoom, which is how we started, um, of course, this is one of the opportunities that has developed from, um, from you know, this, this switch to remote and online working. Um, but, you know, we've had people on the podcast who are, you know, at UT Austin. And we've had people from different universities be able to come onto the podcast and to build these connections um, with people and to have them, you know, be able to talk about their work and share their ideas with our audience as well. So it's, 
it, it, it works out for, for um, both parties on the podcast. Oh, I guess we should just, I don't know what happened, but Dana, oh. I'm going to invite you to <laughs> come onto the floor. Um, so yes. Thank you, Brandon. Uh, yes, I'm, I'm Dr. Dana Little. I'm an assistant professor of digital media studies at the University of Maryland Eastern Shore, um, which is an HBCU here um, in the States, also part of the UMES um, University of Maryland system. I'm a practice-based researcher. So my creative work represents and um, is an output from my creative uh, critical concepts. Um, I've been building on my doctoral thesis factions for years, a couple years now after graduating, getting the doctorate. Um, it's a satirical, speculative, interactive website that examines the effects the problems and the benefits of tech on communication, culture, human to human and human to computer interaction. Um, I created the idea of factions. So there's the website that is called factions. It represents the idea, the concept of factions as a social media storytelling genre that's built on the intermingling of fact and fiction online and that permeates the internet, um, and I'm also the founder of the spinoff of Faction, the website, um, which is called The Channel Show. Uh, the Channel Show stars my digital twin persona that I created for the website, Dr. Wu, an AI mystic that can channel any person, place, or thing. Um, and Dr. Wu does both those things to interview uh, and be the interviewee. So both roles, covers both roles and uses all of it as learning tools, modeling. Um, the show as the spinoff is also a teaching tool that I use in my classes and it's great uh, for media literacy, helps for media literacy. So in an all audio space, how do we identify the thing that is true, the thing that is real? Um, where do we find that, the commonalities? Where do we find um, a way to suss out uh, the veracity of the people who are speaking as well as the people who are listening who might wanna chime in? And so that leads into this idea of why do we, how I, do I, as a person of color, um, like to use the podcast medium? As has been mentioned, it's, it's a great place to relieve some of that tension of the visual. Um, I don't have to be seen. And I was using Dr. Wu, uh, this disembodied AI mystic, as a shield, as a filter, as um, a way around those visuals. But in audio, in all audio, um, we have that singular sense, that just sound, that's it. And so it can point to the differences among us, but it can also point to the commonalities so I'm using the, I'm gonna use my text because my work is script-based. It's very scripted, um, mostly fiction, but also some of built on facts. Um, so I'm, play, I'm paying close attention to how do I position words? How do I phrase things? Um, what are the external things, the non-narrative based effects that I'm gonna layer under or over some of those phrases in order to elicit that, that idea of the theater of the mind. Um, and yeah, I can direct the audience in a certain way, but also it relieves that tension in that, you know, digit, there's digital media and then there's social media. So social media, it requires three things. It is digital, but it's also shareable and it's participatory. So podcasts, they're digital, um, they, they are shareable, but they're not participatory. So I don't necessarily have to worry about comment, comment, you know, and someone coming in and, and kind of interrupting um, and maybe saying things that are wholly offensive. That was one of the things about the website. Um, even though that's, that is definitely social and social media, but we were controlling it. We're controlling our space. It's our page. It's our existence. We're decolonizing 
um, the internet as a whole in our space in fractions. Um, so that that those are the those are the key things that I wanted to use uh, podcasting for. Um, Dana, uh, again, apologies, everybody. Um, something very weird happened with my computer. I don't know what happened, but I'm glad Milan just told me that it wasn't disrupted for you. Um, can I ask Dana to tide us over to the next question, which is, how do we fund our podcasts as uh, people of color, uh, where you know where the resources are, and you know resources for podcasting, they're coming up, but they're still very scarce. And then what policy changes can we campaign for to receive support for this work? Um, I'm kind of in a unique position because I, I, I am at an HBCU and we are kind of having a moment um, where the funding is coming in. Um, but also it, then, of course, if you're at a university, then they want to take control. It's, it's been mentioned, uh, especially yesterday in, in this symposium. Um, so I've been finding the alternative of a lot of public radio stations um, are interested in helping. So that is a source that you can look to. Look to your local public radio station. Look to um, other community radio stations that may not be NPR related or PRX related, but are community, community radio stations. Um, you can also, it is possible to do it quite cheaply. So the biggest, the hardest, I think, funding wise is finding someone to help you with editing. Um, I'm solely, you know, I'm a sole creator, so I do everything on my own. But you can sometimes you can find um, just through soliciting, you can go to certain job boards, um, the podcast network um, app, there's, they, they'll have um, job postings, and you can post for collaborations where you're sharing the workload. So nobody's, you know, not paying someone and they're not paying you, but it's shared. And policy wise, I think I would say that opening up some of these opportunities to um, students, I know that graduate students can be hard um, for them to find the funding. So maybe if um, some professors are using, you know, helping with our platform to get the um, exposure that uh, graduate students need or undergraduate students need. And then that can be part of um, one of the missions of the university or the department. And the chair could possibly spearhead some of these policy changes. That's, that's a very helpful note. Um, Varsha, can I ask you about your funding journey? Yeah, um, it's hard. <laughs> so um, the first um, pilot series was sponsored by uh, NYU. Um, however, I'm not a permanent lecturer um, at NYU London. I teach across universities. Um, but after that, I have been uh, funding it in various ways. So because mine is an interview based podcast, um, what I do do is sometimes I will invite visiting lecturers um, and visiting lecturers and I will conduct interviews in that space. So students get a flavor of uh, their visiting lecturer research, but we record it as well. So that means that everyone gets paid, right? <laughs> like the visiting lecturers get paid for coming in, uh, the students get what they were going to get anyway, and we get uh, a recording out of it as well. Um, then sometimes I would train students, so it's very voluntary, they would say that they want to, you know, receive training, and so I would train students, but in exchange for them producing my podcast in that case, so there are um, a number of ways I'm trying to keep the costs down, um, but I obviously, uh, you know, um, fund uh, quite a bit of it on my own as well as a passion project. And that's fine because as people have said, I am not even sure that I want a university to provide full funding because 
um, there is this element of, you know, independent control, not gatekeeping, or, or as um, others were saying that I quite uh, value. But I think in terms of policy change, I would want academia to recognize that podcasting is scholarly work which takes skill and time and knowledge and research and is not like just a side gig or a hobby. So recognition in the same way as maybe a journal article is recognized, right? It's still your intellectual property, but it is still uh, something that you get a lot of research credit for. So the support that would be great to receive would be time uh, or continuing professional development training funds for that, or space, or access to subscriptions um, and awards. Um, so what I was hoping for, that maybe HBM could collectively offer, um, say, kind of, you know, um, collaborations where we could apply for funding, or at least institute awards in different categories, right? We were talking about student awards, but I think it would be quite useful to just do humanities podcasting awards in different categories, because you know how it is. Once you say you won an award for something, uh, you start getting academic recognition. And another thing that I was hoping that we could do is maybe create a database. So, we have listing for all our members and what podcast they are doing and then offer to review it for each other. So, uh, for example, you know, I would quite like to review an episode of, say, for example, this podcast. And the more we review each other, I think the more academic kudos we can build up around it. Yes, absolutely. I and mean, these are you know things to keep in mind as we go forward and kind of um, build our own academic rituals. Um, Alyssa and Brendan, what has been your experience with Zoro's Daughters uh, in yeah. terms of funding? Yes, I, I will speak on um, the funding and um, the resources and, and maybe Brendan you can speak a little bit to the policies that we might be interested in. So for us, the way that we got started was through a GoFundMe. Um, we had, you know, we bought our mics and I think it was just the microphones. Yeah. So we just bought the microphones with our own money. And once we had produced a couple episodes, we also knew that we wanted to have transcripts um, for people who are deaf and hearing impaired. So we did a fundraiser in order to pay transcriptionists, Black women transcriptionists. Um, and within a few days, I think that we exceeded our goal in order to have the full season um, funded for for transcription, and then we are also able to you know buy better equipment and and things like that. So that was how we got started, and then from there we started applying for different grants and fellowships. And I suppose that that is one of the advantages of still being uh, in graduate school is that there are opportunities like this for you to um, expand the way that you. Um, the way that you share knowledge. So we've received um, several grants. We're also currently on a humanities fellowship um, that is providing us funding for things like social media for our social media assistant to help us grow the podcast. Um, we're you know we're still paying transcriptionists and things like that. Um, and then finally, what we've been doing is Patreon, and Patreon is. For folks who might not be as familiar with it, it's a platform where people can support creators um, and not support them financially. And in exchange, they might get um, certain levels of access to exclusive content or you know, exclusive merchandise and, and things like that. So we've been slowly also growing our Patreon platform and pretty much everything goes back into the production, but there are most certainly people out there who appreciate the work and they want to support you and what you're talking about and what they're learning um, so that it can continue. I think the other things that I would speak about in terms of resources, at least at Columbia, and I think more universities are starting to pick up on this. Um, there was an Inside Higher Ed article that came out last year talking about taking podcasting more seriously. 
So I am starting to see um, universities investing in this particular medium. So right now at Columbia, there is a podcasting class that you can sign up for, and then there's a studio available through the library. Um, and you can go there to record the podcast. It's, it's all included, um, you know, free of charge for, I suppose, students and faculty. And I just think that in general, digital humanities is very much up and coming. Um, and so there are a lot of opportunities to kind of like start building, um, building an audience and building more interest into the, that, into this kind of work. Thank you. Alyssa, Brendan, would you like to add to that? Yeah. Um, I think just to echo what you were saying, Varsha, about this kind of, um, this view of podcasting as something that's less than academic or less than scholarly. And there's an assumption that you don't have to have a particular set of skills in order to do this. Um, I would argue that one of the policy changes that we need to see in the university, but also in other kind of major funding sources for academic work, right, is, is an opening up for incubators or pipelines, right, for people who are interested in, under, or in learning how to do podcasts, right? So taking it seri as seriously or, I don't know, just thinking about a training program for folks who really want to share their academic work in this way um, and something that actually funds people to do uh, the work that we do. So all of us have talked about just like this kind of self-starter, self, like we are doing the majority of the work for our podcast each episode, right? That's a lot of time and energy and money that we don't get paid to do this. And people, this is like real people jobs, you know? So um, <laughs> I think about that a lot, like how, um, what would actually make podcasting more accessible particularly for people of color, particularly for black and indigenous people would be to have set lines of funding, these incubator pipelines, something else besides like Google, the Google program that's out there for folks who want to really be involved in podcasting. Um, and then also for the graduate student side of things, um, actually allowing us to, if we're choosing to do a podcast or something related to our academic work, to use that instead of like TAing or working as a research assistant. So actually elevating it to the position of like work, graduate student work um, in the academy because of the amount of work that it actually is for us to like produce these episodes. So those are some suggestions I have. Thank you so much, Brendan. Uh, I, I was just, I was going yes. to add that, that it definitely takes more than five hours, which I think is what our official <laughs> TA ships pay us for. It takes us absolutely more than five hours <laughs> to make these episodes. So TA ships, please make it happen. <laughs> uh, from your mouth to the ears of academic gods. Um, for a final question, Varsha, can we start again with you? How do we use podcasts to diversify our field or how do we make the podcast sector itself more diverse? I think everyone said that and I cannot say it enough. I think that uh, we really have to pay attention to intersectionalities a lot. So for example, uh, one of the biggest one is deaf people of color. Um, and many podcasters in the deaf community, um, such as Mary Josephs, have insisted that podcasts are attractive to them as well. It's not that they are not interested in the medium, but they often feel excluded. And transcripts is one thing which benefits everyone, so we can do that. But I think we can do more if we have, say, for example, a guest-based podcast, we can invite uh, deaf people on the podcast, right? So I had a deaf guest. Um, I was quite nervous because I didn't know how to, you know, record with um, a, a deaf actress, but she helped me. I learned a lot. Um, and it was one of the most amazing uh, podcasts and learning experiences. So I think inviting them um, is our responsibility to diversify the podcast world even more. And then I think that pedagogy, right? Like um, asking our students to seek 
uh, podcasts that are uh, containing diverse voices. So how do we train them to not only how to produce podcasts, but how do we train them to identify good podcasts and diverse podcasts, just like we would train them to identify a, a diverse um, scholarship, right? Um, including citations, so citing podcasts um, as well. So in one of the things we can do very easily in our scholarly work to diversify our fields is start citing podcasts um, as well. And then of course, uh, varying geographical ranges as well. So, um, and I'm guilty of that too. And I need to try that too, that if we have a guest-based podcast, for example, um, you know, inviting guests from the global south. It's not that hard now with Zoom uh, to record podcasts from there. So those would be my specific recommendations for like interview podcasts that we invite uh, guests of different abilities and um, different geographies and age ranges. And then uh, to diversify our field, I would say teaching our students pedagogically and also citing each other's podcasts. Thank you, Varsha. Um, Dana, would you want to come in? Uh, Varsha, you took all my. <laughs> <laughs> Just kidding. You did, not all of them. <laughs> but yeah, definitely with um, thinking about age and that being thinking without and within your own um, experience, but always from a place of empathy. So, how can you empathize with that other person who is also the other? Um, at my university, I'm really lucky. We, at, at the, the studio and production value um, at the Digital Media Studies program is top notch. It's industry level. Um, from video to audio, we have a number of different um, audio suites for editing, for recording, uh, podcasts and music. We have a radio station um, on the bottom floor of the building and TV production, as I said, um, a studio control room. And so they can do video podcasts as well. And um, so my students are, you know, I teach understanding audio. So they all get the opportunity to start their own radio show, their own podcast. Um, faculty members can do the same thing. It's all 100% free. Um, we teach them Anchor, but they can, I use Podbean, I'll also help them with that. I use Descript, um, as has been mentioned, and other um, panels during the symposium. So that's for transcription and for also overdub um, using my own voice. The AI can mimic my voice and then at different emotional pitches, whatever I train it to do. And, um, and I teach my students those things as well. And then they get access to Adobe, the full CC suite. So they get audition. So I train them on that. And then we have the Hawk Media Group um, and any student in the university can use, in other words, all of the tools that the digital media students get automatically, um, as long as they join this group. So that's one way that we're able to diversify because our university, even though it's an HBCU, it's not just, there's not just people of color. Uh, it's, it's people of many different backgrounds. And one of the backgrounds that I like to focus on sometimes is, well, not just first gen, so I was first gen, generation uh, at college, but also um, low income. It, it's just such a huge problem that doesn't often get um, focused on enough. Um, the, the, the fact that people can be hampered, so hampered um, in the university setting by their class. So um, in, in trying to afford a university education is ridiculously difficult at this point. So another tool that we use is for our study abroad and any of it in our foreign language. Um, I encourage the students, like right now, we have a student who's in Japan and she's sending audio postcards back to me. And then um, myself and Dr. Wu together, we will use that material in order to uh, spin it into um, teachable moments. And audio postcards can be anything, and I, I could get into that more, a little more later, but um, those are the different tools that we try to use in order to diversify. That sounds like a wonderful repertoire. Um, and Descript um, sounds at the same time fascinating, but also really intimidating. So I'm gonna explore that. Um, 
we will close out this section of our talk today with Brendan and Lisa talking about um, the same question. Thank you. Um, I think that for us, our the goal that we had with our podcast was to share this information and share these theories and, and knowledge that are being built on the backs of Black people and Black experiences and share that knowledge with them. And so it's been from day one um, incredibly important for us to be able to, to reach all kinds of people beyond the walls of, of the ivory tower, right? So for us, of course, that is one of the tenets of, of Black feminism is accessibility. And we think about that in, in a number of ways, one of which is, of course, the transcripts that we produce. But also it's about being available and being in a place where people are able to actually find and listen to us. So that means that our podcast is available for free, right? Some people, they pay well their podcasts or um, they have advertisements or you can only hear a certain portion of their podcast. Um, so in order to diversify who listens, uh, we offer the podcast for free. Um, on top of that, we are on social media. We're all over. We're on Instagram. Um, we are on Twitter because that is where you're going to get the, the lay listener um, having access to the podcast. And so the reason that we have a social media assistant right now is... Um, is so that we can grow our listeners, particularly beyond um, the academy. So I would say that accessibility has been a core, um, a core point of our, of how we go about the podcast and how we go about diversifying it. You know, Brennan, if you'd like to add anything. Yeah, and I would say that one other thing that we, um, strive to do in each of our episodes is to make sure that um, that our language is also accessible. So when we're using different terms um, or different, maybe what folks might consider to be jargon, we always make sure to explain what those things mean. Um, and, you know, my family who, um, so Alyssa and I are both also first gen, uh, Dana, and so we really think about um, how do we bring the work that we do home, right? And how do we bring it home to our families um, who don't have the college educations that we have? And in my case, right, I have family members like my brother who, you know, does not even have a high school diploma, right? So it's important. Uh, and he listens to it. He calls it a broadcast. He, he doesn't really understand what a, a podcast is, but he calls it a broadcast. Um, and like my grandmother and my aunt, apparently um, sit out on Sunday afternoons. I found this out a, a couple of weeks ago and listen to the podcast. Um, and so it's something that like, and that for me really affirms that like what our aim to be accessible to bring black feminist frameworks and theory and just um, anthropology to folks who think anthropology is about messing with bugs or digging up dead bodies, right? Um, Bringing, bringing our version of it to them, it's just been really enriching. Um, and it's something that as we continue with the podcast, we're, we're thinking about how can we make, um, make it more accessible and make academic theory more accessible. So one of the things that we're looking forward to um, in the next stage of things is thinking about how do we reach folks who are actually illiterate and helping them understand or learn certain types of black feminist theory. Yeah, I think meeting people where they're at is very, is, is like a key, um, yes, a, a key way to structure your podcast. <laughs> Thank you, Alyssa. Thank you, Brendan. Uh, I think we're making a really good time. We have 14 minutes uh, left of this session for a more open discussion. So um, you, you're welcome to just speak out your question or comment. You're also welcome to raise your hand and I will call on you.
I mean, I do have a, a follow-up question, yes, uh, question for Varsha, which, which Brendan put in the chat, but I'm also curious to know what was the experience like and, and what was it that you had to learn um, when you were recording with, uh, with your guest who was deaf? Oh, right. Um, yeah. Um, so what we did was um, I contacted this guest, of course, um, via email, and I asked them to suggest uh, people that they would use for um, signing, right, and translating, just like any other language. Um, so um, we, I, I think once I got used to getting past my own ignorance and just realizing that that is another language, right? They are signing, um, so I could use a translator. So once I realized that, what we did was we used an interpreter and um, I would speak, the interpreter would sign uh, to the deaf um, um, uh, guest, then the deaf guest would sign and then the interpreter would um, translate that. Um, so what we recorded was still the voice, um, but uh, it was very much the words of uh, the deaf guest. Um, so in a way, I think that to uh, include, like really include people, um, it would not, I think it would not be fair to say have just the one video podcast for uh, the person who is signing, right? Um, and we treat it as their words. Um, so that's how we kind of conducted that process. And I thought that uh, what I learned from it was what can I do um, so that not, you know, so that it's not tokenistic. So it's not like, oh, okay, you know, this is um, the one episode we uh, record like that. How can I make my podcast more accessible? One was through transcripts, but the other things were like, if we are, for example, having a listening party, uh, sometimes I do that uh, with a, a bunch of people, or sometimes when we are recording in situ as well, um, I'm always trying to make sure that we have text, we have captions. So what I learned from that was that, you know, you don't have to just do it for one episode. Um, how can you make podcasts generally accessible um, to everyone? Needless to say that I am um, very much um, in favor of inviting um, guests because they have wonderful things to say and different embodied experiences, as Dana was saying, um, uh, to, to share. Thank you, Varsha. Uh, do we have another question? I guess one. Sorry, yeah. I was gonna say I wanted to hear. Yes, um, please. Hear you talk, Dana, more about um, this class that you have about. I forgot the whole name of it, but the class that you mentioned about audio, um, and just to hear some of some of the other activities that you have students do. I thought it was. I think it's really wonderful that y'all have that those resources on campus that students can access freely. Um, so I'm, yeah, I would just love to hear more about what activities you have in your syllabus for students who, um, how do you build their knowledge up about like using these tools? Uh, yeah, Brenda, thank you, thank you. Um, it's understanding audio and it's meant to be an overview of how audio functions, how it works, waveforms, and then we move into microphones. So we go from the actual physics to the tools, and then we go into story. So I start to talk about outlines, even if you're doing something that's not scripted like my own, typically they're going to be doing something that's more nonfiction. So we wanna go over the outline and then basic templates. And then I wanna go over the science of storytelling. So it, that idea that I mentioned earlier and that there are particular phrasing you want to be making sure that you're encouraging a certain word function and knowing what those word functions will elicit in the human brain. So what kind of emotions, what kind of um, hormones are, is it going to release? Is it oxytocin? Do you want to release um, something that's more empathetic 
or something that you know, hormone that's going to encourage outrage. You can do that. And some people are really good at that. We know of certain former presidents that were masters of it, didn't know what they were doing really, but we're just intuitively very good at it. Um, I want the students, this is part of that media literacy element uh, to understand what it's doing, when it's doing it so that they can do it and that we can recognize when someone else is using phrasing in the science of storytelling. Um, and then we move into small little itty bitty 30 second, 60 second pieces, demos. And we're gonna start to think about not just the storytelling, but mixing and remixing. And then we're going to go into longer pieces. And this would all add up, these minor activities are going to lead to the ultimate learning objective of a portfolio piece. Because they have to do a capstone, everybody has to do a capstone um, in this major. So their capstone should include different ways of representing what they learned and throughout their entire time at the university. So I want them really, I mean, uh, obviously audio is my baby. You know, I started in radio um, years and years ago. So um, podcasting is so awesome. Um, but I want them to have that appreciation of what can they do in just fine tuning the various pieces of audio. And so in the, Afri the, the other course, one of the other courses I teach, Afrofuturism, I, I talk about the fact that you can use audio, not just music, because that's kind of the go-to. They just automatically go to, oh, well, I'm gonna use this sound, you know, this sample. And I'm like, well, what are the other ways that you can tell a story with audio? So, and then that understanding audio, that course is really all about that. I hope that helps. That sounds fascinating. Uh, and so many things to pull from. Um, do we have another question? I guess uh, I had a question for um, Brandon and Alyssa because you talked about um, the grants that you applied to and, uh, you know, like what is, or just like, what are some of the grants that are available for podcasting specifically that you have found? Or, and um, I guess the, also the associated question is, do all of them require the podcast to have an institutional affiliation? Um, not, not all of them. So the ones that we've gotten have been from the institution, except for one. There was one, it was kind of more of a contest. Um, and I, I remember everyone getting, getting it that applied from my recollection. Um, and that was, that was through a brand. I can't even remember the name of it. But the university ones, they tend to be either um, diversity or student activity grants. Mm -hmm. um, and then, so we've gotten the racial justice mini grant. So I think part of it is also how you frame it, right? Like the podcast is, it's, it's an end, but it can also be a means to something else. So for us, it's, it's also a means to racial justice. So we do apply for diversity grants, diversity fellowships, um, racial justice grants, um, diversity grants. And then the one that we have right now, which is through the Heyman Center at Columbia, it's a public humanities fellowship. So that one is specifically looking at how we can um, how we can improve on and spread kind of like public public scholarship in general. And then some other ones that we've applied for did not we weren't successful with. I can't remember if it required, do you remember if the Sloan Foundation re required an institutional affiliation? No, they don't require, um, they don't require it. Uh, and I was yeah. just trying to find the one with the um, NEH, because that's the one that I was thinking of yes. earlier. Um, the NEH, the NEA as well, the National Endowment for the Arts, I think. And then the Sloan Foundation, there are other, there are other like those major foundations. Um, I think the Ford, Ford Foundation also has fellowships that you could probably find a way to, you know, work the podcast into. Um, so yeah, Ford Foundation, Sloan Foundation, there's another big one that I'm, uh, that I'm blanking on the name of. 
but I think it's it's also like any proposal for grant money um, for research and all of those kinds of things. It's really about how you frame your work. And the podcast is, you know, is right now a very um, sexy means to to sharing knowledge. So it definitely adds an advantage to getting those kinds of grants. Just like following in, um, from that, do you think it might be worth creating some sort of resource which is central where people can go adding, um, you know, different uh, means of funding that they have found, um, a, a sort of regional maybe or resource where all of us put in, you know, all the grant monies that we can apply to and so on. So I think that might be something that, um, as HPN kind of members, we can do. Yes, for sure. Uh, Milan, uh, I don't know if you want to speak this, but we're definitely doing this um, as part of what we're doing. Um, it's also like, as you know, those of you who are the, who are the plenary, uh, HPN is very decentralized. And personally, I've found over the last two years that that's one of the best things about it. And, uh, you know, the things that really have worked for us is that, you know, this kind of uh, absolute, you know, distribution of tasks and power. And I'm, um, I think, you know, this will definitely happen very soon. We're already putting it together. Um, we are almost at time. I just want to put in, uh, in the chat, uh, I don't know why the copy paste function is not working. Milan, would you mind uh, just, typing in the uh, form. This is a form for suggestions um, uh, for HPN. So please uh, use this form either now or any later time to put in your suggestions and comments, how we can improve what we're doing here. And um, I think we are at time. So thank you so much, Varsha, Brendan, Alyssa, and Dana for this wonderful, wonderful presentation uh, round table. This was so worthwhile and I'm glad we planned it because I think it went pretty uh, smoothly. This was really good. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you for inviting us and for allowing us to share space with you all. This has been great. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. I, I loved sharing the um, space with all of these wonderful speakers. I've been listening to your podcasts as well. So it's been um, such a thrill. And thank you for hosting us and thank you for listening to us and thank you for sharing us. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Uh, see you.